that I can clarify the title. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you uh, to the organizer for organizing this. Oh, I have to turn off on the word the microphone. Oh God. Okay. Now this is better, right? Okay. So let let me uh, thank the organizers for organizing this nice workshop and uh, for inviting me to give a talk. Um, I actually, uh, you know, changed uh, my mind about the talk that I wanted to give. So you might have uh, realized that the title is not exactly the same than uh, what I had announced in the first place. So this is more uh, related to using uh, recent optimization technique to. Um, uh, learn uh, conditional random fields for applications in, in machine learning. So, I mean, you know, this is, this is about uh, micro random field, but I mean, through, a, I guess, a different lens uh, than uh, what we have uh, heard about uh, so far in the, in the workshop. What I'll present is uh, joint work with my PhD student, uh, Shell Shu uh, Hu. Uh, and um, yeah, so. Um, SDCA here uh, stands for Stochastic Dual Coordinate Ascent, and I'll explain in a minute uh, why this is, um, this is relevant. Um, so, you know, just to start with a, an image and a motivating example and sort of something concrete, um, um, I would like to, to start with this image. So, uh, you know, this is an important problem in, in, um, uh, in I guess, many uh, applications to be able to process images and to uh, segment them and identify the objects within them. Um, and today, this is an application where the type of learning algorithm that you would use is not conditional random field. Uh, today, you would use uh, deep learning algorithms. Uh, basically, uh, you know, something like between uh, eight and five years ago, um, conditional random fields were sort of superseded in this type of application by deep uh, learning algorithms. But I still kept, uh, you know, this illustration because uh, I think, I mean, my, uh, the, the focus of my talk today is going to be about, you know, learning CRF in general and not like just for this application. And um, I like this um, illustration because I think it gives a concrete uh, example, which I think uh, might be better to understand the setup, uh, at least if you're not uh, too familiar uh, with the uh, uses of conditional random fields in, in machine learning. Um, there might uh, still be a number of cases where uh, you might want to prefer to use conditional random field instead of using neural network for uh, maybe not exactly this application but similar applications because uh, deep neural networks um, require to have uh, a lot of uh, labeled data um, and then you know they reach uh, great performance but there are a number of applications where you have a smaller uh, smaller amount of data and the way you can parameterize the conditional random field is, is, is advantageous in those cases. So um, just to give a few examples, a couple of years ago we worked with uh, uh, colleagues on facade parsing. So you, know, you have images of buildings and you're trying to uh, detect the windows, the doors and different parts of the buildings and by parameterizing cleverly uh, a mark of random field we could encode the fact that you know, very often the windows and the doors are aligned and this was sort of hard coded uh, in, the, in, the, in the structure of uh, the model, and this is something that is not so easy to do with uh, neural networks, even though there is interesting research to do there. Um, there are also other um, applications where you know, somehow CRFs are natural and, and neural networks um, are less. But uh, my main point here is, is to show this application to present the framework in which I want to uh, work and to present a, a fast learning algorithm. So the idea is that at each pixel, so we're going to view this image as a, as a grid of pixels, and at each uh, pixel you have to classify the corresponding pixel in a certain semantic classes, uh, in a certain semantic class. So you know, for example, road, sidewalk, uh, wall, tree, um, traffic sign, a pedestrian, and so on. So I think here there are eight. Uh, semantic classes. So uh, essentially at each pixel you want to make a solve a multi-class classification problem but of course you'd like to leverage uh, the spatial structure of the problem and um, model the fact that uh, those uh, decisions that you make at neighboring points should probably be related. Um, and so I would like to consider a conditional random field model to try to learn this problem, propose a fast learning algorithm for it. Um, and um, uh, what I would like to try and, and leverage is recent ideas in uh, convex optimization um, that um, have allowed uh, 
people to solve very quickly optimization problem that um, are of the following form. So uh, you want to minimize a, a function f plus a certain regularization and typically f of w is going to be some empirical risk for a machine learning problem. And whenever you have an empirical risk, it is usually the sum over uh, a large number of terms, which is the number of data points that you have of the loss evaluated at, for, at that data point. So, uh, you know, typically uh, the, little fun the function f index s that we would consider would be um, a certain small function f s of uh, w transpose phi of xs. And so if we take the particular case where this function takes this form, then L is a loss function, uh, ys is uh, a label, our output variable, and then we would try to learn um, a linear uh, function of a certain feature representation, uh, phi of xs, which is the input um, data, right? And so typically, uh, if we have um, um, a, um, a empirical risk, which is a sum of terms of, of this form, then um, our optimization problem is actually of the form minimizing with respect to W, a sum of a large number of functions plus a regularizer. And it turns out that um, when your problem at, as this structure, it's possible to use um, a um, algorithm which are stochastic gradient methods with variance reduction techniques. So what is the general idea of, of this algorithm is at each iteration, uh, instead of computing a batch gradient, um, you pick a single of, of these functions and um, you compute a stochastic gradient. But instead of, you, of computing the classical stochastic gradient, you compute um, a stochastic gradient that has a certain structure um, that allows you to uh, make it that as you are approaching the minimum of the function, the variance of your stochastic gradient is actually um, converging to zero sufficiently quickly that um, your algorithm behaves at the beginning like a stochastic gradient algorithm, but then as you start converging, your algorithm becomes more and more like a deterministic uh, batch gradient descent. And so people have shown that um, using these algorithms um, on finite data set, you can get very fast uh, convergence rates that are, you know, essentially uh, uh, making the, the best of uh, what you can get with SGD and what you can get with uh, gradient descent. And there are several uh, algorithms in that family. Um, so SVRG stands for Stochastic Variance Reduced Gradient. Um, and then, you know, I won't say all the acronyms, but SAG and SAGA are like two uh, famous algorithms in this family. And the one that um, I would like to um, be considering is an algorithm which is called stochastic dual coordinate descent, which is actually of the same family, but this is not obvious because it is written in the, in the dual. So uh, the way you, you, uh, you uh, implement this algorithm is you have to first transform your optimization problem here um, by writing its Lagrange dual. Um, and um, essentially, if um, fs star here is the uh, fential dual of fs, then, uh, you know, it turns out that, um, I mean, this is uh, something which, which is maybe um, a big step here if you haven't um, looked at these kind of things before, but like this is standard to transform, um, you know, this type of objective in that time of uh, Lagrange dual um, for this empirical minimization problem. And in the dual, what happens, we have a property which is called dual decomposition, which is that um, essentially for each data point um, S, um, we have a dual variable alpha s, and so the, the dual objective is a sum of functions that each depend on only the dual variable corresponding to a single data point. And then the, 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 the dual of the regularization terms uh, term is, is becoming this uh, term that somehow um, combines, I mean, is a norm of the uh, linear combination of the feature representation. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, in, in this dual problem, uh, th this term is relatively, I mean, the, 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 it is this term that dominates and uh, you have obtained uh, in the dual of, of an op uh, optimization problem which almost decomposes for each data point, basically. Yes? So this yes, sorry, so yes, I forgot to mention this, so... Um, uh, that's right. So, so in the um, in the setting that I consider, I'll assume that the um, the loss that we are working with um, is convex. That's right.
this, or, or, or the small function fs that we're working with are, are convex. Um, and then, you know, we can basically solve uh, very quickly this dual by uh, um, randomly uh, selecting uh, one of the coordinates and uh, doing a, um, um, you know, it, it's like a, a gradient step, except that it's a, a proximal step. So I, I will not get into the detail there, but um, the, the point is that um, we obtained uh, by, with this formulation, um, an algorithm which can be interpreted in the primal as one of these uh, algorithms that um, are stochastic gradient methods with variance reduction um, and that have very fast uh, conversion. So, so uh, to give you an idea, basically, um, I sort of gathered um, the theoretical results that are known for these different algorithms. So if um, n is the number of data points that you have or the number of terms in the sum, um, and if we have a... Um, you know, the problem is going to be characterized by a condition number and the ambient dimension. And then uh, this is the running time. I'm writing here the running times to reach uh, an error epsilon on the, on the uh, a gap of epsilon on the, on the optimum. So um, you see that, uh, I mean, basically gradient descent um, is a function of the logarithm of one of epsilon, which means you obtain um, linear convergence there. Um, there is this al accelerated algorithm which um, reduce the dependence in the uh, condition number, and then using these, um, this family of algorithms that I've just mentioned in the previous slide, so this stochastic variance uh, reduced, uh, this, uh, yes, this, uh, uh, this stochastic gradient uh, methods with, re with um, uh, reduced variance, um, you actually get uh, dependence in the number of uh, data points that combine n and k additively instead of multiplic multipli multiplicatively, sorry. So, I mean, this is basically uh, th this makes quite a big, a big difference in, in practice. Okay, so um, the thing is that um, those uh, algorithms obviously are applicable to problems of uh, this uh, form. And uh, if I were to try and uh, if I come back to my example of semantic segmentation, if I was trying to classify each pixel independently, uh, then I could um, use uh, multi-class logistic regression, for example, on each pixel, and my objective would be of this form, and then I could be using this algorithm and I would be happy. But uh, what I would like to do is I would like to consider a conditional random field in which um, the graphical model is not, is not of this structure, but um, I want to model the, the interaction between uh, the, um, the, the, the classes, uh, the choice, the predictions that I'm making for each pixel, right? So you have to imagine that this is like one dimensional image with like each of these being the pixels and these connections correspond, the red connections correspond to the connections of the, of the graph. And in that case, um, you know, I've actually uh, coupled everything and my objective doesn't have any more uh, a structure which is a sum of, of functions. So um, what we um, uh, sort of looked at in this work is, you know, how can we uh, try and um, consider a formulation in which we, we would be able to still leverage uh, these, um, these fast algorithms to have fast learning for conditional random fields. Um, and to do that, we'll have to, you know, obviously do a number of appro approximations. Um, okay, so to explain um, the formulation that we consider, um, I mean, I, I have to start from the conditional random field and rewrite it in a number of ways. Um, and uh, one trick that I, would, I will use is to write the log likelihood as, as a log partition. So um, to um, make sure that what I present is, is clear, um, let me explain this, this trick uh, first. Uh, hopefully this, this uh, will, help, will help. So I apologize because the next couple of slides are a bit... Uh, technical, but somehow if I skip right away from um, here to the abstract formulation that I will consider, um, I think um, you've, you will find it uh, obscure. So um, the idea is that um, I have um, observed data, right? So, so X, O, and Y, O are my um, observed data points. And uh, you can consider this as being here, so X, O is going to be uh, the whole input image and YO is my uh, semantic segmentation, so the, the whole output uh, image. And so if we uh, would like to model uh, the negative log likelihood here uh, using an exponential family, then our exponential family will be of this form with phi, uh, some uh, vector of sufficient statistic, uh, W, the natural parameter, and um, uh, this being the log partition function. 
that obviously, uh, since it's a conditional model, depends on the input um, x0. So if I write in practice what this log partition function is, well, it's the log of the sum over all the possible values of y of um, this exponential. And when I say all the possible values of y, remember that what I call y is uh, the entire um, segmentation. And so if there are um, ten pos eight possible classes per pixel and I have a million pixel, um, there are eight to the power one million uh, different y, so this is a very big sum, right? So this is, I put it in, in, uh, in red, and this is an intractable sum, but, uh, and we'll have to somehow take care of this at, at some point. Um, the, what I would like to point out is that um, um, what we can do is we can, the term on the left, uh, we can write it as the logarithm of its exponential, and uh, as a consequence, we can actually push this term inside of the log, log sum exp. And uh, you know, write just here the difference of the sufficient statistic with uh, the the same, uh, but uh, here at the observed value. And um, now, um, you know, this is the general formula for an exponential family. But I would like to apply this to a graphical model. So uh, the uh, vector of sufficient statistic will actually decompose on a certain number of cliques. So in 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 the case that I presented, the idea is that the cliques will correspond to. Um, all of the nodes in the graph and all of the edges connecting uh, neighboring nodes. So I will have unary potentials and binary potentials. Uh, so you know, the set of cliques here will be two types of cliques, the singletons and the pairs, uh, or the edges. Um, and uh, for each of the type of cliques, I will have a certain parameter. Uh, and so you know, this is why I have a sum over all the cliques of this expression, right? which is sort of a specific instance of, of that. Um, and the idea is that we can yet rearrange this expression in another form which is uh, going to be convenient, which is to say that, um, um, in fact, uh, we can, for each uh, clique, we can consider all the possible values of yc, list those values um, of the dot product between w, tau, c, and the possible values then this can take, and then um, basically take the, y, the, the real yc out. Uh, and write this as uh, an, inner, an inner product, right? So, I mean, you basically list, like you introduce a dummy variable yc prime uh, that lists all the possible values, and then you can rewrite, uh, you know, this expression as this dot product yc dot theta c, where this is now, um, you know, a, a, uh, something that looks like a, a canonical parameter, but which is obtained as the product between features and w, okay? So, um, uh, basically, my point was just to take the log likelihood and to write it as a log partition function of something which is a sum of dot products. Okay, so uh, let me now uh, explain what is the particular instance in the case of our conditional random field. Uh, so uh, specifically, I, we have an uh, input image x, I have features at pixel uh, phi of s. At each uh, pixel, I'm going to encode the class by an indicator variable. So ys is going to be the, the class at pixel s, and um, it's going to be a vector with k components, where a single of these components is one, uh, and the others are zero, so it's a, it's a POTS model. Um, uh, if uh, we were making predictions of each of the pixel individually, um, I would have a multi-class logistic regression model which uh, I could write uh, this way, right? So with a different parameter for each uh, class and um, um, you know, the, the vector here corresponding to the different outputs. Um, and the conditional random field that I would like to consider um, is um, essentially taking the multi-class logistic regression model. So basically here, uh, these two parts of the model are the same, but I'm going to add an interaction term between uh, adjacent uh, output values. So uh, again here, um, y, s, k, and y, t, l, the product of these two is going to be one if uh, pixel s uh, is from class k, pixel t is from, from class l, and the potential that is associated to this is, is, is this parameter. Okay. So um, I can rewrite this, um, uh, this uh, POTS model. I can abstract it out, so I can you know, say that um, the, this expression, I can rewrite it as the dot product of w tau 1 with a feature vector that in general depends on the output and the input. And uh, the second term, I can also sort of write a more general expression, which is um, a uh, feature of the two output variables and the, at, at these nodes and the, the whole 
um, input, even though here the input is not there, but you know, like this is fine to, to, to generalize to this case. And uh, then once I have made this um, you know, more abstract form, then you, you see that uh, in both cases, so I have, a, I have basically here cliques of size one and cliques of size two. And so in each case, I have a parameter here tau one and w tau one and a parameter here w tau two, which are associated with two, these two types of, 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 of cliques and uh, which are uh, multiplied by a feature vector associated to the corresponding clique. So um, I can uh, write this in an even more abstract form as a sum over cliques of uh, the vector of parameter which is associated to cliques of type tau c times, sorry, times um, the, this feature vector, and then you know I have to introduce the log partition function, right? So far, I've sort of wrote proportional to, and I, I didn't introduce the log partition function. Um, and uh, of course we know that this log partition is intractable, but then if I use the trick that I presented in the previous slide, then um, you know, the, log of the, uh, the log of the conditional model is of this form, and um, I can rewrite it, so this is the theta, this uh, product is the theta that I had, theta c that I had introduced in the uh, previous slide, and then you see that basically the whole point is that uh, uh, when we have a, a conditional random field model, we can write it as um, F of a dot product of a certain design matrix that contains information about the data time a parameter vector W with F which is actually a log sum X function, so a, a log partition function. Okay? Um, all right, so um, now that we have identified that essentially the, 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 we have this log partition function that, that is, is appearing, um, the idea is that um, our uh, optimization, our learning problem um, can be reformulated as the minimization uh, with respect to, to W of uh, F of uh, C transpose W plus a regularization term, where F is now this um, uh, log partition function associated with the corresponding graph. Okay. Um, and, um, and so, uh, the problem there is uh, is that um, you know trying to optimize uh, this. Uh, I mean, we know that this log partition function is is uh, difficult to compute. That its gradient is difficult to compute, um, and um, uh, so it's possible to use uh, uh, stochastic simulation methods. But um, uh, those are uh, in general relatively uh, slow. Uh, and so uh, what I consider is, is to use variational uh, methods to uh, try and uh, solve this minimization problem and then like do some relaxation that are allowing us, are going to allow us to uh, have a, a more efficient algorithm. Um, so, okay, so maybe this uh, slide is superfluous, but this is just to contrast this, uh, this with the disconnected case. So again, if, if we were considering the disconnected case, then, um, you know, we would have, um, uh, something where the log sum x uh, is appearing at the, pix the level of each pixel, and then like this is tractable, we can use those fast algorithms, and in particular we could use um, uh, stochastic dual called it descent. So the idea is, you know, whether in the previous formulation I can actually uh, obtain a formulation which would look like this. Um, so the idea is um, to uh, try and, so I said I would like to use uh, variational methods, the idea is to try and leverage uh, what we know about um, the Lagrange dual of this optimization problem in particular to use the fact that the Fenchel dual of the log partition function is actually uh, the, the Shannon entropy, right? So we know that we can actually write the log partition function as the maximization over moments associated, vector of moments associated with the um, conditional, uh, with the, the uh, Markov random field or the conditional random field uh, of um, this dot product plus the, the Shannon entropy. Um, so, of course, this, uh, um, so this would allow us to, to construct a dual, but then, um, you know, there are a couple of difficulties. So let me int introduce the, the object here. So uh, the, this set of moments here, um, mu, is called a marginal polytope, and essentially it's a collection. So mu is a collection of small vectors that are each associated to uh, one of the cliques in the, in the model. So here uh, there would be, uh, you know, a vector mu associated with each node and a vector nu, uh, mu associated with each edge. And essentially each of these mu c 
uh, has to be a probability distribution, so a marginal probability distribution on, so for example, on, on the nodes, that would be a probability distribution on the uh, k possible values that correspond to the k classes that you could uh, assign to this pixel. Uh, and for the edge, it would be a, like a probability distribution over k squared values corresponding to the, to, uh, to those, um, uh, to those um, uh, pairs of pixels that you could, to pairs of classes that you could assign to the pair of pixel. Um, and uh, H Shannon is the Shannon entropy that uh, it turns out you can compute directly from the moments. Uh, and so if we go, uh, start from our primal optimization problem, uh, we can actually uh, write a dual optimization problem which is equivalent, which is uh, based on the, this dual objective, um, which is now, so this is like you know, the negative of the Shannon entropy. Uh, what I wrote here is the indicator of the marginal polytope, which is uh, equal to zero if we are inside of the polytope and plus infinity otherwise, uh, and uh, this term which is the regularization. And so uh, then, you know, the, the, this primal problem is equivalent to the maximization of this um, dual uh, problem. Uh, actually, this should be a minimization, sorry. Or no, maximization, yeah. Um, but then there should, okay, there should be a plus here. Um, so the difficulty is that, um, again, in the dual, uh, we have a formulation which is intractable because uh, the, um, the, both the Shannon entropy and the marginal polytope. So the marginal polytope has an exponential number of, is defined by an exponential number of constraints. Um, and uh, the, the Shannon entropy is itself intractable to write uh, for a general graph and for a grid uh, in particular. So the idea is to um, replace, to try and, and you know, consider this dual uh, problem, but then to use a relaxation. And uh, a classical relaxation is based on using the local polytope. So um, the lo what is the, the idea of the local polytope? The local polytope is basically, um, the idea is to, to, um, to take the marginal polytope and to consider only constraints that belong to the constraints that are defined, defining the marginal polytope that uh, involve uh, single cliques and uh, pairs of, of um, uh, sorry, that involve, um, single nodes and pairs of nodes that are adjacent. Uh, so in, in our particular case, um, so I will construct the local polytope as, as follows. So let me first define for each um, node. So uh, here, this is my set of, of um, cliques that are nodes. So, so for each S being a pixel, um, I'm going to consider the simplex, which is the set of new S, which are probability distribution. So that are uh, non-negative and, and whose entries sum to one. So again, like mu s is a vector of dimension k, which is the number of classes. Um, and then I introduce a similar object for each uh, edge. So this time you want to think of mu st as being a square matrix of size k by k, which is uh, the joint probability distribution over the class assignments for uh, the nodes st, and it has to be non-negative. And uh, since it's a probability distribution, it has to sum to one as well. Um, and so with this, I mean, the collection of all the simplex constraints on all nodes and all edges, this is what I will call the independent polytope. So this is a Cartesian product of constraints on, on all these uh, small moments. Um, and what the local polytope is, is basically the set of these moments in the independent polytope that are actually consistent with each other in the sense that you would like to enforce that when you take um, a moment on some edge and you sum over one of the two variables, you get uh, the marginal uh, moment, you get the moment that corresponds to one of the nodes, right? So uh, if I sum over t mu st, I should get mu s, and if I sum over s mu st, I should get mu t. Um, and so let me point out that uh, this local polytope can actually be written as the intersection of this independent polytope, which is a Cartesian product, which therefore decouples over all the cliques, with um, this uh, what I, uh, set of equalities that I wrote in, in pink, and which are just um, a set of linear constraints. Right? So I can write uh, this, this set of linear constraints as uh, a certain matrix A times mu equals zero. I have a, a big linear constraint that encodes all these uh, constraints. Okay, so that's, that's um, so the local polytope is going to be my relaxation. It, it can be shown that the local polytope, the, the marginal polytope is included in the local polytope, and um, I'm going to use the local polytope as a relaxation for, for M. 
Um, but unfortunately, I cannot compute the Shannon entropy either, so I need to introduce a surrogate for the, the entropy, and uh, there are many surrogates that, that exist, and the difficulty is to find one that would uh, be suitable in, uh, to, to, to my case. So uh, since I would like to try and leverage ideas from uh, convex optimization, I have to have a surrogate that would be convex, and so this is probably the step that you know, might be the most shocking maybe uh, for um, uh, uh, an audience who um, is, is uh, uh, you know, having a, a perspective inspired by physics, which is that you know, I'm going to do something which is somewhat brutal here. So I'm, I'm not going to consider the bait entropy, which is it, because it's, it's not convex. And I would be more inclined to uh, consider uh, the uh, convexifications of the bait entropy, which would be the tree reweighted entropy. But the difficulty is that the tree reweighted entropy is uh, convex on the local polytope, but it's not convex outside of the local polytope. And I need a function that is, that is, uh, that can, is, is convex um, somehow outside. So what I'll do is I'll uh, consider an approximation of the family of approximation of the entropy where I can actually write the, the, the approximation of the entropy as a sum of um, terms on all of the cliques where I'm going to require that each term is smooth uh, and, and convex on uh, the simplex. Uh, and uh, I would like in addition that this approximation is strongly convex but only on the, on the local polytope. So um, in the numerical experiments that, that uh, we have, uh, that I will show, uh, we've used something which is relatively simple. Which we've used the Gini entropy uh, for each of the terms. And we've also considered um, like something which is more, which is closer to the uh, tree reweighted entropy, which is to use the oriented tree reweighted entropy. But I'm not going to um, uh, describe the, the details here. The whole point is basically to, to obtain um, uh, an approximation of the entropy which decomposes over cliques and which has uh, nice uh, convexity uh, properties. Yes? I mean, okay, so um, yes, sure. Uh, so, I mean, for example, in the, you know, in, the, in the simple setting that I'm describing here, I've got nodes and edges, and obviously the edges uh, overlap at, at the nodes, right? I mean, the, the, the nodes. Exactly, yes. So, I mean, uh, if I just use the Gini entropy, I, I cheat and I don't do that. But if we use the oriented tree reweighted entropy, um, this is a way to actually uh, account for that. So, you, you know, the oriented uh, tree reweighted entropy uh, basically is a, a weighted average of uh, entropies associated to spanning trees. Uh, and so basically you pick a root and you orient, uh, you know, you can create a, a spanning tree from that root and then the entropy terms that you, that you uh, add are conditional entropy terms that, uh, you know, take into account uh, the term that you need to subtract. And they are all with positive yes. So it remains, it remains convex, yes, yes, yes. Um, Okay, so then, so, so we start from, so I, I said we're going to do two relaxation, replace the marginal polytope by the local polytope, and replace the Shannon entropy by this approximation. So then why do I get? So basically from the dual problem that I was introducing, I get this uh, tractable dual now, um, which uh, has um, this form, right? So um, I've replaced this function by this one, and I've replaced the marginal polytope by uh, the indicator of the, uh, uh, the, uh, independent polytope and a big linear constraint. And then I've got this term that corresponds to the regularization which I wanted to have. Yes? Uh, okay, so that's, uh, you're asking the difficult question. So, you know, as far as I, as I uh, know, uh, there is relatively little, little literature on how, what you lose, on quantifying what you lose when you actually go from, uh, you know, this formulation to, to um, uh, to, to this type of formulation. So, I mean, you know, this is, there is a gap here in the literature and, you know, like in this work, we didn't try to, to tackle that aspect. Right? So we, we don't know how much we lose, uh, uh, you know, from a, uh, when we go from this approximation to the other one. Um, okay, so uh, now, um, you know, if you look at the structure of what I have introduced, so um, since the, um, the entropy here is a sum of these uh, entropy terms uh, that are just on cliques, and uh, since uh, the independent um, polytope is actually constraint, is actually uh, the sum of constraints that each um, uh, moment here should be uh, inside of a, a, a given simplex, 
uh, you can see that I can, if I uh, take the sum of these two functions and I call this mu c star of f c star, sorry, of mu c, um, then I can basically rewrite my dual problem as the sum over cliques of these f c star of mu c. So I have now a dual which is a sum of functions on uh, cliques minus g star, which is the regularizer, and I'm, I'm fine to have a generalizer that couples the different cliques, um, and um, then, you know, the linear constraint. So if I didn't have the linear constraint, um, if I didn't have the linear constraint, at this point, um, if you remember the form of the objective that I was trying to, that I was leveraging to use stochastic dual coordinate ascent, um, I could just apply uh, stochastic dual coordinate ascent on this problem. But of course, I have the linear constraint. Right, so I, have, I still have to do something to get rid of the linear constraint. And then the standard thing to do in, um, in convex optimization is to um, uh, introduce uh, an augmented Lagrangian formulation. So, um, um, so the idea is to uh, replace uh, this um, linear constraint by, um, uh, so C here is a Lagrange multiplier, uh, multiplied by A mu, and then uh, this is the augmentation term in the, of the augmented Lagrangian, right, that, that um, basically allows to have uh, some, um, some strong convexity. Um, and, um, okay, so uh, what we know is that if I maximize with respect to C uh, this, uh, this uh, objective, then, uh, you know, this, this is the same as uh, d mu. And so, uh, um, sorry, if I, if I minimize respect to xi the dual objective, uh, I get d mu. And so, um, basically, what I, I would like to solve is to minimize respect to mu, the, mac the maximum with respect to, sorry, to, to maximize respect to mu, the minimum with respect to xi of uh, d rho mu xi, right? But, um, but uh, by strong duality, um, by strong duality, we can exchange the order of the maximization and minimization, right? Uh, and so um, I can actually, instead of um, maximize respect to mu, the minimum with respect to xi, I can actually uh, maximize respect to xi, the minimum with respect to mu. I can exchange the order of my uh, min and max. Um, and uh, therefore, a natural uh, way to solve this optimization problem is to actually um, somehow so, uh, optimize respect to mu, so maximize respect to, to mu, and then uh, when we're somehow convert, when we have converged, uh, then we can actually use that to compute a gradient of uh, this function dx and do a, a gradient descent step with respect to, to x and uh, iterate. Okay, so, and it turns out that the gradient with respect to xi um, here is very simple because it will just be um, A times, you know, if, you, if xi uh, appears only here, so the gradient with respect to xi is uh, A times uh, mu xi, where mu xi is the optimal value of mu uh, for this optimization problem, right? So it's the solution of that optimization problem. Right, that's what I write here. Um, so obviously the, the, the thing is we don't want to solve a sequence of optimization problem. We don't want to have to, you know, uh, up, minimize with respect to mu uh, up to a high precision and then take a, a gradient step with respect to xi and then again solve another optimization problem. So what, we'll, uh, what we want to do is to uh, essentially partially uh, optimize with respect to mu and then update xi and then partially optimize to mu. And the question is what is the minimal amount of work that you have to do so that uh, you, you still make uh, progress. So, um, so the idea is to optimize a bit with respect to mu using stochastic dual coordinate ascent and determine like, you know, what is the smallest amount of work that we need to do to make progress and then to update the, the Lagrangian uh, parameters. Um, okay, so um, at this point, let's see. So um, I may uh, go relatively quickly uh, on the result that we have, but basically, so uh, on this optimization problem, there are two gaps. Uh, one gap which corresponds to, uh, you know, the optimization problem on, on mu, which I called uh, delta hat t, and gamma t, which is the, op the gap on, on uh, the objective as a function of, of xi. And um, long story short, uh, if uh, somehow the algorithm that we're using to optimize on mu, which um, I will propose to be stochastic dual coordinate ascent, uh, has the guarantee that um, after 
um, a fixed amount of effort, we can uh, reduce uh, this gap by a factor beta, which is smaller than one. Then we can show that uh, the algorithm is uh, globally convergent, and not only globally convergent, but that the gaps are actually converging at an exponential rate to, to, to zero. Okay? So that depends on, I mean, basically, the, the, what needs to be done is that uh, this, uh, eigen, this eigenvalue of this matrix has to be smaller than one, and this specifies how much work you have to do at each uh, step. Um, and so, like, based on this, we can show that uh, if you do a fixed uh, number of iteration of stochastic dual uh, gradient ascent on, um, on mu at uh, each epoch, uh, then the algorithm is, is globally convergent, right? So, um, and, and linearly convergent. Uh, so that was the problem in the dual, um, but we can actually show the same thing for the primal. So if we optimize in the dual and we actually remap the dual solution to the primal uh, via this mapping, then we can also show that um, we have a, a, a linear convergence in the, in the primal. Of course, this is linear convergence in the uh, primal and a primal that corresponds to uh, this relaxation based on the local polytope and on this uh, approximation of the entropy. Okay, so I mean, there is a lot of related uh, work um, that was um, that, that is, is done on, on, on this topic. Um, essentially, so um, one thing that I should uh, insist on here is, and maybe I haven't insisted on like sufficiently uh, at the beginning, is that uh, the traditional approaches to learning conditional uh, random fields would be to update the parameters, and then um, once you have updated the, the parameters uh, to compute the gradient, you have to solve an inference. A problem, which is usually itself uh, an intractable problem. And so you have to, at each iteration in the classical approach to learning CRF models, you have at, at each iteration to solve, you know, a whole inference problem, which is uh, hard. Uh, the advantage of this type of formulation is that basically the whole learning algorithm has one single inference procedure embedded in it. So, you know, we, we learn and do the inference at the same time. So this is not our idea. Uh, the first ideas of, of uh, formulation that we're trying to go beyond the standard formulation are these. And then um, um, they are like, you know, work that are uh, closer to, to us. But essentially, nobody had actually made connection with stochastic dual coordinate ascent and obtained like, you know, algorithms that, um, uh, for which it would, we could show formally the type of, conver of, of linear conversion guarantee that, that, we, that we showed. Um, so, I mean, in the, I have like li very little time remaining, so maybe let me just you know, show you a couple of experiments. So, um, I mean, I have to apologize here because I don't really have um, you know, the curves that, uh, or the experiment that uh, would be suitable for this audience. I have comparisons of our algorithm with um, you know, algorithm that people have, formulations that people have proposed in the machine learning community, which uh, somehow these people have established our state of the art and which, you know, uh, we are uh, sort of comparing with because uh, we know that if we're doing as well or better than these methods, then we are also achieving the state of the art. But in the method that I'll be comparing with, I don't have any methods that are sort of the classical methods that would leverage, you know, uh, uh, belief propagation on the graph or something like that, because I'm comparing with methods that you know, have been already shown to be um, um, essentially uh, significantly faster. So I'll compare with um, um, these methods, which um, actually sort of uh, proceed by following a similar approach than the one that I've presented, except that um, they, they use a penalty method, and so the um, the the, the, the the dual problem that they consider doesn't enforce consistency between the, the different moments. Um, and then a more recent uh, formulation, which somehow is a greedy version of the, the previous ones. Um, and so, um, so I have a synthetic data set and uh, like a, an actual semantic segmentation uh, data set. And um, basically our algorithm is the one that um, is in uh, orange or, or yellow. Um, and uh, so I'm showing here the, the, the duality gap, so the convergence uh, guarantee uh, between the primal and the dual. And so you see that we have linear convergence and we're faster than this other algorithm. And the, the contenders that we have are not solving exactly the same problem, so they cannot have a duality gap that converges to, to zero. Um, and, um, um, you know, 
Uh, in terms of accuracy, we, however, reach the same performance, but I mean, that's maybe not so surprising. Um, and uh, on a real segmentation data set, um, our algorithm is actually uh, sort of um, not doing as well as a uh, stock block coordinate Frank Wolf. And like this, this is something that at this point we don't quite understand well is that these block coordinate Frank Wolf algorithm, in, even though they have, uh, uh, you know, different guarantees seem to be performing very well in some cases. So here it's a case where uh, there is, uh, we have removed the entropy and this is more like a support vector machine type of formulation. So it's a max margin structured problem. And then I, I will stop because I'm uh, over time. Um, so uh, I presented uh, a formulation which allows us to leverage stochastic dual coordinate ascent, uh, where we could show that we had uh, global uh, linear convergence um, uh, algorithm for the primal in the, in the dual. Um, and uh, so, you know, our algorithm can be uh, used in other uh, problems in which um, like the, the different terms are coupled by a linear constraint. Um, and there are a number of questions as of, you know, how we could still further improve this. And so the algorithm right now is stochastic in, in mu, but it's not stochastic in t. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So...